Um, so Acts 16, 1 through 15. He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy, um, Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his compa companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Amicia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave from Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put, on, put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Theatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. This is the word of the Lord. So if you've been following, I think most people were here last week, there, there's a lot going on in this, this chapter, and you're probably thinking, what the world is Paul doing? Because for the last chapter, they just spent this whole council meeting talking about how circumcision wasn't needed anymore. And now what does he do? He turns around and he circumcises Timothy, this new person, this new companion who he's going to take. And I think, I think as I've framed this sermon in these sections, I think when, one thing that I've seen through it is what I'm calling, let me get to it, strategies for mission or strategies for missional living. It's not that these apostles and, and are just arbitrarily walking around and going and doing things that don't make sense. There's, there's very specific reasons for some of the stuff they do. And they're also in touch with what the Spirit's doing. And so there is some aspect of, of strategy to their mission. And I think that that also has implications for us. Um, so before we uh, dive in, let's, let's, um, let's look to the Lord in prayer real quick. Father, we uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for just the fact that it is life to us, um, that it is forming for us and Lord that we need your word um, and we thank you that you've given it to us that we have this direction Lord we just um, ask um, Lord just as um, psalmist writes that you would just open our our eyes our our hearts and our minds Lord to just to behold wondrous things out of your law that we might be transformed more into your image in your name we pray amen so this is what I want to look at, strategies for ministry. So it's kind of like our first chunk of verses. And then, or, or strategic ministry, strategic places we'll kind of look at next. So it's kind of this, the, the journey that they, uh, Paul and Timothy and the other people with him travel on. And then we'll look at strategic persons. And yes, people in ministry like, co what, what do we call it? They like to, they like, um, you know, it's strategic, 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 you know what I'm talking about. We like things that rhyme. We like things that go in, um, in pairs of threes, repetitions. That's what, that's what it is. Um, okay, so first, Council of Jerusalem, chapter 15. We just looked at it. The whole issue there was over, there were some Jews who were saying, were, were troubling the minds, as it says, the, the Gentiles, that they needed to be circumcised. And they decide, 
the council, they decide that, and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit, as it also says, that the Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. They don't need to take on the um, ritual, the Jewish ritual, because they're already, they're, they're part of the family of God by the Spirit of God. Circumcision does not anymore, because of Christ, does not anymore give them entrance into the family of God, as it was in the old covenant. So the new covenant, Christ comes, and the Spirit of God is what makes someone part of the, the new family, part of the new covenant. So then we now get to um, this section here, and chapter 16 begins with Paul choosing Timothy, who we know is, as it says, is mixed. So he's, his mother was um, Jewish and his father is a Greek. Now, there's lots of reasons probably why he wasn't circumcised. And one of those reasons would be that most in the ancient world, most um, children or even wives followed after the faith of the father. So it's possible that maybe his father just didn't want him to be circumcised and, so, and, and his wife, the mother just was, you know, she couldn't do much about it. And so that was that. So that there's probably good reasons why he wasn't circumcised. But, but we know he wasn't. But Paul, he wants him. He, he likes Timothy. And one thing that's, that's interesting is that we're told that he has a good reputation or um, he's spoken well of by the brothers who are there. So in other words, he's not just a nobody. But it's also interesting that his, he's spoken up, he's spoken well of in the sense that it also doesn't say that, oh, well, he was a really good teacher or he had all this, you know, this really great skill set. He had a good reputation. He had a good character. He was a, a, a solid choice for Paul to pick to, to accompany him on his ministry. Because as we just saw that there was that little split, right? So, um, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, and Paul was like, no, this dude is, um, he, he tried to flake out on a previous mission, so they split, right? So Paul now needs a new person to go along with him, and he chooses Timothy because he has a good character. So there's, there's a, a good reason here for Paul to pick him. But then, we, the, but then he circumcises him. He just takes them and circumcises them. And then immediately after, the next verse, it says that they, they go and deliver the message that the, the Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. Is this a contradiction? Like, is Paul a hypocrite? You know, what's going on here? And especially given the fact that Timothy has some, some Gentile in him. He's half Greek. And of course, my answer is no. It's, he's not contradicting himself. And he is not um, hypocritical here. What's going on is, and I think the, the, the key here is, because of the Jews in those regions, so if you have um, your Bible, you, it might be helpful to, to follow along. So you see, because of the Jews in those, re in those regions, that is the, the, the very essence, I guess, or the reason why he is circumcised. See, Timothy's Jewishness, in a sense, trumps his Greekness, if that makes sense. It, his Jewishness carries more weight than his Greekness does. And so by that very case, it's important for him to be circumcised because they're going to deal with, with Jew, Jews on the road. They're going to be dealing with Jews on their missionary trips. And it's important that they don't run into any more issues. So they just had this issue debate. And so it just makes more sense. Paul is being, what I would say here is strategic. So his view, he, he's circumcising Timothy in a strategic sense, not in a salvific sense. And I think that that's a, that's a really, really important point. Paul does not say that circumcision is, even for, for Jews, he, he, he doesn't take issue with it necessarily. It's, it's, it's almost somewhat neutral. As we, and I'm going to quote a few passages that show that. So for him, it's, it's neutral at this point in the New Covenant. If you were Jewish, fine. Keep, you know, the, the, the circumcision is, it's not bad if you keep getting, if you keep circumcising your, your, your boys. However, 
it, it does not carry the same type of weight as it did in the Old Covenant. Because in the Old Covenant, it meant that it was a sign that you were part of God's covenant family. And what was happening is that the, the Jews at the time were saying, that brings salvation. You need, you need to be circumcised because that gives you salvation. And so therefore, the Gentiles needed that. And Paul's saying, no, 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 you don't understand. We're saved by grace. We're not saved by circumcision. So in a strategic sense, this is what Paul says in Corinthians. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became one as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became one as outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in the blessings. First Corinthians. In other words, Paul is saying, he will do things that are moral. So I'm not saying this just, it gives us um, the, you know, licentious behavior that we can go do whatever we want if we think that it's, you know, expanding the gospel. Handing out tracts inside of strip clubs is not what Paul is talking about here, right? Like there, it's, what he is saying is he will become and go and do and go into the places that will win people to the faith. He will do what it takes to save some, in other words. There's, there's, there's a strategy there. He has something in mind that, <clears throat> that he's, he's having in mind those who he's ministering to, if that makes sense. But not in a salvific sense. So Peter in Acts 15, previous chapter, Peter, he says basically that we are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus. We are not saved by circumcision. So Peter, Peter set that, that ground rule, right? This is what Paul says in Galatians. He says, look, I, Paul, write to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts cir- circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. And now he's talking about those who keep circumcision in a salvific sense. So those people will be required to keep the whole law. And then he says, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uh, nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So what Paul is saying is that, in a sense, circumcision is now neutral. So to get it as a Gentile doesn't mean anything. To not get it as a Jew doesn't mean anything. Is it bad to get it as a, to continue receiving it as a Jew? No. So it's, it, in a sense, it's neutral. So then why would he then make Timothy get it if it's, if it's neutral? Well, again, it's, it's, he's being strategic in those who he's going to go minister to. Because remember that the split between Jew and Gentile is one of the strongest splits of any people group in history that we, that we know of. <clears throat> they did not commune together. They did not dine together. They did not talk to each other. There was, there was, it was almost um, scandalous for that to be the case. So this is a big deal. So he's having in mind that they're going to run into Jews, and it carries weight for, for, for him to be uh, circumcised. It's almost like him going, not, not undercover, but it gives him a sense of credibility in those who he's going to minister to. And I want to mention that this is the same Timothy who Paul writes to, First and Second Timothy in the book, books of First, first and Second Timothy. Timothy becomes a prominent figure in the early church. And he has a significant impact because he has this, he's kind of this hybrid mix that he has He's in touch with, with Jews, and he also is in touch with Gentiles and Greeks. 
And I think that that is, it, it becomes very important and vital as they do ministry. So then second, strategic places. So we see that in that um, second group of, um, of verses, um, six through 10. And they went throughout these certain regions. And it said that the Holy Spirit um, forbade, forbids them from speaking the word in Asia. Now, this isn't the same Asia that we think of now. This is, um, so in the ancient world, Asia was kind of this cluster. And I have another map that I'm going to, well, let me actually pull it up. So I don't know if you can, if you can see this. So that was Asia. So Asia isn't what we think of now. So this wasn't um, like a racist thing. This wasn't something that God was like, no, don't go to those provinces. Don't, don't, don't go to the east. What he's saying is don't go to this specific region. And it seems kind of weird why that would happen. And, but I'll show you what's really cool about this um, once we get into the last point. So you can kind of see that um, they're kind of down by Lystra and Derby and Iconium, and they, they kind of start to travel, and they pass through Asia. They're going to go up to Bithynia, and we see that the, the Spirit then directs them in a different direction, redundantly. But we see at first, he forbids them from going to Asia, so they're like, okay, we're not going to go to Asia, so let's go up to Bithynia. And then the Spirit of Jesus doesn't allow them to go up into Bithynia, so they change their their direction and they go a different course. And then there's this vision that Paul has um, a, the, a, of going to Macedonia. There's a Macedonian man that calls for help. And I'll flip back here just so you can see. And I think what's, what's, what's cool about this is that the spirit works with their plans as well. It's not like he just showed up and God was like, or Jesus was like, hey, don't go here. You're going to go straight to Macedonia because there's a woman that you're going to speak to who's going to be influential in the rest of, of the church. That doesn't actually happen. And I think that it's cool because God is actually working with their plans. They still have agency in their mission. Paul still has the ability to make decisions while he's on the road and say, okay, we know we can't go to Asia, but let's go up to Bithynia. And I think you know, oftentimes that's how our decisions are made, right? Like we're, we're often not, God doesn't often appear to us in a vision and say, you know, I, I want you to move to this city and join this company or join this church or you know, I want you to marry this person or whatnot. Oftentimes it, it, it's, it's through us acting that we end up finding, we get confirmation. And I was just actually talking um, to, um, to someone about this the other day of just oftentimes our decisions are, are affirmed by things in our life. There, there's confirmations, but there's still agency. There's still action required on our part. So sometimes making sense of God's plan is just, is actually us making moves. It's us acting and what we feel like the spirit is leading us to. And I think it's cool that, you know, it, it says that concluding that God had called them. So Paul gets this vision of a man and, and it's not even explicitly divine. Like Paul, like the, if you notice that it doesn't say an angel, it doesn't say a, a divine being, it doesn't say, you know, the voice of God appeared to him. It just says a man appeared to him in a dream asking for help. And so, to me, we're literally concluding that 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 um, that word in essence is to is to to gather things together, to pull things together, and to form a decision. Is what Paul is doing. He's he he he's coming from his vision, and, and essentially he's he's making sense of what's going on. Now it makes sense to him why he was forbidden to go to Asia, and now it makes sense why the spirit prevented him from going to Bithynia because he's supposed to go to Macedonia, right? So he, he puts those things together and concludes that this was the spirit that was directing him and then that God wants him to go preach the gospel in Macedonia. Does that make sense? So then strategic persons. Um, 
Who is Lydia? Well, Lydia is, I think, a really cool figure in, um, in scripture. They make their way to Macedonia. They spend a few days there, we're told. And then Paul and Timothy and whoever else is with him, they go to the place where there would be prayer. So it's a Sabbath day and it's outside the city. We're told it's somewhere by a river and presumably there's probably no synagogue in, in um, Philippi. So Philippi is the city that they go to. So they're outside the city gates and they're, you know, and Paul goes and finds these women. And what's interesting and cool again, is that who was it that appeared in the vision? It was a Macedonian man. And as far as I'm, as far as I can read, there's no men here. I mean, it, Paul goes and, and he finds a group of women and he just sits down and talks to them. And there happens to be one woman named Lydia who pays attention to what he's saying and is receptive to it. So Lydia is a, we're told she's a merchant of purple. So that was actually kind of um, very, very prominent for this area. And the, um, the city that she was actually from, Thyatira, was known for it. Purple is also, um, it was a very kind of tedious craft. Um, it really took a lot of, um, of um, things to create it, like a lot of elements. Sometimes they would create it from, I was reading like shells. They would crush up all these shells. And apparently it took a ton of shells to get just like a tiny little bit of purple to which they would use for dye. And, but in, in where she's from, apparently they use something else. So, but nonetheless, purple is also royal. It, it is seen in many ancient cultures as royalty. So she's this merchant of purple. She's a businesswoman, and she's probably a Gentile. Um, it's not 100% clear. Luke tends to specify Luke, the writer of Acts, tends to specify usually who's Greek or, or, or who's a Jew, um, as we just saw with Timothy. But it says that she's a, just a worshiper of God, which usually means that you were a Gentile and you worship the God of Israel. She's also probably single or widowed because she appears head of her household. And at the time, men were the head of the household. And so she wouldn't have had that type of agency in the relationship. She was also probably rich enough. Um, she made enough money. She wasn't top, top tier, but she also wasn't just struggling because she had a large enough house told that she has a household and she houses the disciples. So at least Paul, Timothy, and whoever else Timothy has and whatever servants that Lydia might have. So she has this house. It's, it, it's large enough for many people. So she's probably has a, has good enough status. And I also think it's, it's really cool. Let me pull the map back up. So if you see where her hometown is, it's smack dead in the middle of Asia, which was the same, the same region that they were told not to go to. And yet where the spirit sends them is to a prominent city, Philippi, which was in comparison, maybe to a United States city, it's not New York City. Um, it's not, you know, it's not Washington DC. Maybe it's more of like a Boston. It's, it's, it's a prominent city. There's influence coming out of it, but it's not, you know, it, it, it's not the, it's not the most, it's not Rome. It's not the most influential city, but they're, they're directed to this really, really influential city. That's, that's a Roman colony and has, um, has a power and status and there's trade going through there. And they go to minister to a woman who's from a town in Asia. And I just think that that's really cool. And you see the spirit, how God's plans work through this whole situation. It is not just a point A to point B type of thing. Now, I, I want to do a, a really quick excursus. It's like a fancy word that's always in commentaries, Michael knows, um, on women in the Roman Empire, because I think that this was important for this passage. I think it's important for the context that they're in. So by and large, in Roman society, 
women were advancing in society. They were like the, Lydia's position was not abnormal. Like for her to have business, for her to have a house, for her to own property, that's not abnormal in Roman society. That wouldn't be totally out of the ordinary. And if, especially if her husband died or she was um, single, um, she would have had um, she would have had agency. She would have had independence from her father. So most fathers died pretty young. So if her dad died and she was single, then she would have been pretty independent as a as a woman in um, in Roman society. Greek culture, on the other hand, was a little bit more strict. They they um, yes they you know they they glorified women, but they they were a little bit more strict when it came to public life and to to civic life as far as women were concerned. Um, and I think it's interesting because, as I was like doing some research here, that both Roman and just Gentile women in general tended to actually gravitate towards Judaism um, in, this, in this time, or at least were like sympathetic towards it. Um, and partly because they, they were less bound to household and civic cults. They had more freedom, actually, in Judaism. They had more protections in Judaism than, than, they, than they would have had in Roman culture or they would have had in their, whatever their Gentile culture was. I mean, we see through scripture that um, it talks about, um, uh, you, you know, in Proverbs, it talks about, you know, women owning um, businesses and being trades women and having property. Um, and of course, a myriad of other um, examples throughout scripture about, um, about women being, you know, equal with men in, in in God's eyes, and and having more liberties than the the surrounding culture is. And we often think that, um, you know, in in our kind of Western progressive um, society, that the world around them maybe wasn't as, you know, that like we can't. Well, basically, what I'm saying is, in other words, we can't project our Western cultural view on that culture, in a sense. So, to say that um, you know it, it it was it if you don't have a Christian view, if you don't have a what I'm seeing here in the Bible view of, of women, then you can't really say that oh they were they had it all wrong back in you know that time period. We tend to criticize or Western secular culture tends to criticize the world back then. But culturally, it was totally okay the way women were treated, and no one thought anything of it. So to be kind of progressive today is, it, you know, without a, the moral grounding that we have with Christianity, is, it just doesn't hold any ground. It doesn't hold any water. So again, by and large, women weren't as bad as they could be treated in Roman culture, but yet at the same time, for what Paul did and what Luke is trying to show here, that this is a little bit more on the progressive side. He has a much higher view of women than most other cultures would have had. They probably wouldn't even have written about women. You wouldn't find women being talked highly of or even mentioned in, in rhetoric and writings in Greek culture and things like that. It just wasn't, it just wasn't so much the case. And I wanted to read this just because it, so this is from, this is Keener, he was a commentator. Um, and um, he says concerning, so this is concerning public life. He says, although Roman law treated women as equals of men in some respect, it did not do so in the majority of ways affecting public life. More significantly, Luke's portrayal of close public association between male agents of the kingdom and women does not suggest or does suggest that Luke favors the approach of more progressive cosmet cosmopolitan contemporaries rather than of extreme traditionalists. Even though this approach could have appeared scandalous to more traditional minds or to those looking for excuses to attack early Christian movements, that women follow Jesus along with male disciples and some learn at his feet was certainly unusual among ancient rabbis. So all in all, there's a more positive view of what's going on here. And the fact that Paul positions himself in a, a public area with women and to converse with them and to teach them 
and to kind of view Lydia in, um, in this higher regard was a little bit countercultural for that time. And I think as we're seeing in Acts that the gospel is constantly crossing cultural, racial, ethnic, geographical, gender lines, like we're seeing all of that stuff just get broken. And it's because the gospel is for all nations, tribes, and tongues, right? It's what the, the message has been being preached from the very beginning of Acts, that this is good news for literally everyone. And that, that uh, Peter recognizes that God shows no partiality. The gospel shows no partiality. It is for literally everyone. And it's cool that Lydia plays this very important role in the church at Philippi. Many people think that it's, it, it's because of this conversion, and Lydia is, is one of, well, she's probably the first convert, at least recorded, that is outside of the Jewish sphere in Paul's ministry. So she's the first kind of European convert. She's not a Jew, and she's a woman in a very important and prominent city who's gonna have a ton of influence on those around her. And many think that is, it, is, it is her house that, that is the, the church in Philippians that Paul writes about in Philippians. And Paul talks about these um, women. It's not, Lydia's not mentioned by name and there's other reasons potentially for that. But Paul talks about these women in, in the end of Philippians, how they were helpful to him, how they encouraged him, how they helped the ministry so it's very, very possible that her house was the first house church in Philippi. But it's cool that God also chooses Lydia. He's the one that opens her heart to hear what Paul actually has to say. So yes, Paul went and he searched out places where there would be people that he could preach the gospel and he happened to find Lydia, but God was still the one that was ultimately working the plan. God was the one that was ultimately had Lydia in mind to open her heart to receive the gospel. And so it's both our agency as those who are saying, okay, we're, we're going to be strategic about how we're going to do mission, but at the same time, it is also God ultimately who has the end in mind, which gives us an enormous amount of peace and confidence, right? Because it means that if we already know what the end is going to be, then what we do in the middle, it gives us a ton of freedom. And it, it lifts a huge weight off of our shoulders. You know, if we think that we have to save everyone and we think that all the responsibility is on us, if everyone, Todd, if everyone has the free will, if it's all on the responsibility, on the responsibility of someone to choose God and to be receptive to his word, how many people have we passed that we're going to see in the, in the hell line when we're, when we're going into heaven? I mean, we shouldn't be in here. We should be out preaching, right? If, if that's what we believe, if we really, really believe that. But that's not what we see in scripture. We see that while our agency is important and God has chosen us to be his instruments of spreading the, the gospel, he, at the end of the day, has the, the control. He's the one who has the final say and the final decision and the final destiny on whoever we're ministering to. And that should give us a ton of peace. So if we mess a conversation up and, you know, or if we, we don't share the gospel to that person when we had the perfect opportunity to and we just totally miss the moment. And I'm sure we've all had those, those times. And, and actually, we were just... Um, Michael, Glenn, and I were just talking about this the other day of just missed opportunities, right? When you're like, oh, shoot, that was perfect. I could have talked to her about, about Christ. But if I didn't, if it's, all on, if it's all on that person to accept Christ, then that's on me. She's, got, she, you know, she's in the hell line because, or he's in the hell line because of me. But that's not what we see in scripture. God has the ultimate say. So then, as we've kind of been ending all of our sermons through this book, is, is asking the question, what shall we do? 
we've heard the word, now what should we do? And I think it means being, well, strategic about our ministry. And I think it's kind of like, well, it's perfect that as we talk about later in our, our vision meeting, um, that this is kind of lined, this is kind of all lined up. Being strategic about our, our ministry is, is not necessarily, it doesn't mean that we just go, you know, we should go into Times Square and, you know, use a megaphone and start telling people that they're going to go to hell if they don't believe in Christ or going on the subway or going to the street corner. That may not be the most effective way to do ministry. You see, Paul finds places where there would be potential converts. He goes to the place of prayer and has conversations in that in that arena. We see it elsewhere. We're going to see in a few chapters that Paul goes into the um, he goes into the, the places where all the philosophers meet, and he, and he just starts striking up conversation with them. He's strategic about where he goes and where he has conversations with people. But it's also receptive to the Spirit's leading and the closing of doors. I think what, sometimes what we might perceive as, as hindrances in our lives might very be God's just, it, it, it's his direction. Like, do you, th I mean, th there must have been some frustration on, or, or on the part of the disciples of thinking like, why aren't we allowed to go into Asia? Why aren't we allowed to go to Bithynia? Why aren't we allowed to, to do this? Why aren't we allowed to do that? Why is this door closing? Why is the, uh, you know, why did this job end? And whatever that could be, I mean, it's, it, it, whatever hindrances you might perceive in your life, it could be financial struggles, it could be physical ailments, it could be just general suffering, things that we think, <clears throat> this feels like it's inhibiting me from living out whatever mission God has called me to, or I felt like I've just completely been derailed, whatever plan I felt like I was on. But that may not be actually, it may not be God necessarily completely throwing us off and stopping us, but it could be him sending us in a certain direction and, and helping us navigate as we go through life. And then I think um, it's also just being aware of the places that God has put us in, to be evangelistic. And we often joke about the women in our church who are awesome, working women with careers, and you're just out there busting it. and and. You know, and some of the men over here were students or, you know, retirees or whatever. Um, but you guys are, are awesome. Um, and so what, like, what are the places that you're actually in? You know, we, we talk all the, you know, we talk a lot about, obviously, we want to do ministry and evangelism here in the church. And we want people to come to our church, of course. But you spend 40 hours a week at the minimum with coworkers and probably more through conversations that you have and, and going out for drinks and all, this, all those places. That's 40 hours a week at the minimum that you have with people that are non-believers who, who do not know Jesus, who don't know the hope that we have. So thinking about those spaces, what, what, what spaces are you in that you can be effective ministers of the gospel? Like we don't know exactly what Paul said to Lydia. And it doesn't really matter, because at the end of the day, it was God that was opening her heart, right? He was just being a faithful minister of the gospel. The food, <laughs> the food. great. And so again, the, 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 the assurance of our evangelism is God's sovereignty. Wherever we're ministering and whatever places we're ministering in, the assurance of our evangelism is that God at the end of the day is sovereign. And so think about what spaces you might be in where God has placed you in your every single day from tomorrow on that you can be effective ministers. And I think it wouldn't be um, right if to not think about Jesus as 
the best and ultimate missionary ever. Of course, right? We have to say that. But think about Jesus for a second. Jesus takes on this role. He is not one of us, but he becomes like us. Jesus is not from earth, right? God is, is, is not from where we are. And yet he comes into our earth. He comes into our space. He takes on our nature. He, he, it, it's all foreign to him. And he places himself in those situations. He adopts our language. Just think about that for a second. The God of the universe binds himself to our language, to one local language of the time. Now, presumably that was Hebrew and Aramaic. But he, he, he binds himself to, to our culture. He was an ordinary Jew, the son of a carpenter. He was probably also a carpenter. He was subject to taxes, to sickness, to hunger, to thirst, to loss, to theft, to, to all those things. He was poor. He was outcast. He was broken. But we see that he positioned himself in places where he could minister. He positioned him places where there were ministry opportunities. He dined with tax collectors and prostitutes. He went to the synagogues and taught there. He spent time in the city and outside the city gates with people. He went to the well where he knew that there would be folks there that would be drawing water. You see, Jesus comes all the way into our spaces, unknown to him, that it's not, it, it, the earth is not natural. He is the ultimate missionary. Does that make sense? And so how much more for us who have been saved by that grace, saved by his love, and we think about the length that Jesus went to, to make us his own, how much more for us to live that out in each of our spaces, to do that boldly, to do that confidently. Let's pray.